dad had a country store. And I, I know I was about five years old. Well, I went to school when I was five because my brother went to school and I wanted to go with him. So my dad went down to the principal and asked the principal if I could come to school. And he said, she's not the right age yet, but she cries every time my, her brother goes to school. So he said, well, we'll try her. So he tried having me there and I passed everything. So I was five years old instead of six when I started to school. That's <laughs> well, I liked it from the first math I took, adding and subtracting and dividing and all that. And I liked it all the way up. I didn't like geometry very much because you had to figure out too many things. <laughs> but I liked trig and I pursued that more than any other. Started out $19 a week. Then it went up to $25 a week. And that's it. But then I got a job at NASA. I had an engineer friend that worked at NASA. He and his wife were my good friends. And he, one Sunday he came to me at church and he said, Phil, you ought to go out to NASA and apply because they're hiring. Because he was a boss, so he knew. So I went out and applied got a job that afternoon. I went there and uh, they said, where did you go to school? I said, Unionville High School. Well, who were your teachers? This guy was interviewing me. And I said, well, it was when Elizabeth Thrift and Frances Horton from Roanoke taught me down here at Unionville. And they said, you got math under those two teachers? He says, oh, I know them, and I know you're, <laughs> you're, you're, you know what you're doing with you, if you took math under those two teachers. And I said, that's the most ironic thing I ever had to do mm. in my life. That's amazing. <laughs> it is. Your interviewer knew your teachers? He knew my teachers. And knew their reputation? And knew them. He lived in Roanoke, but he was working at NASA. And they lived in Roanoke, and he knew them. And he knew when they taught me, too. So he said, if you took math under those two teachers, you're qualified for the job. So that's how I got my job. I didn't have college, so I couldn't become a mathematician. But I did work for my division chief for five years. We had a lot going on. We had the astronauts there. We worked for, you know, did math equations and stuff for them. They did test. Um, um, we had. Um, a wind tunnel, and that started it out. And then all these companies would bring in their models, put them in the tunnel, and then they ran the tunnel and got figures, and we had to solve the, the equations. We were computers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> About five foot one. <laughs> right. No, that's what it started out to be. We were computers. Right. And then they got the computers, and they had to change us, change our name. <laughs> so you we were, were called computers. Yes, we were. Mm -hmm. We we did everything a computer did. 
Then they got the computers, <laughs> and we were mathematical technicians. <laughs> but I didn't have college, but I had a lot of math. I remember ration. I remember doing folks sugar. Uh, we had honeybees. We raised honeybees. We had ten hives, and mother would uh, cook with honey instead of uh, sugar. I remember the, the the troop trains. For some reason, I knew that Roosevelt's body was coming through, and uh, uh, I don't remember who told me, but I went out on a hill, right at the track, and to wait for it. Apparently it stopped at Weyburn and refueled and I remember it coming by. I could not tell you whether it was the morning or afternoon. I think it was afternoon and uh, I remember it coming through watching it. It was four or five cars pulled by a locomotive and the, uh, Roosevelt was in the back part and I could look through the windows and I could see the casket with a flag on it and a soldier standing at attention at each corner. And, but before the train got there, I saw this uh, two truckloads of soldiers going along the Brickyard Road uh, pretty fast, cloud of dust. <laughs> and I was told that every crossing, the soldiers got out and they were staying at attention. And they would leapfrog each other to the next crossing and stand at attention. The train was not going fast, it was going fairly slow. Uh, but I remember that. That's that pictures and certain things hit us in life that just we leave an image on our brain. And I had that photograph on my brain. I'll never forget it. Because he had automobile parts. Because he owned a shop outdoors that that would main it ran and worked on cars. So he had uh, Model T parts and all of that, Model A, and uh, he had everything. If, you, if he didn't have it, you didn't need it. it I, I grew up with Sarah D. Eden Post and uh, Norman Walkwell, his paintings, I love them. I got a calendar of them now. Uh, but anyway, uh, the pot belly stove, you'd see it in pictures and all people sitting around with the crackers and the cheese and all of that. And I remember that and I have experienced that. And uh, I'd love to do that. After I was married, we didn't close the lobby of the post office until uh, 7.30 at night. And uh, so I'd go out and close the post office. I'd lock a door and I'd go in and I'd listen to those men sitting around the stove there talking. And uh, I'd learned so many things. See, my mother used to make her own quilt, oh. and um, and uh, she's uh, well, at the mill down here. Yeah, she used to get the old sacks, yes. and then they were colored, right? And some of them were white. See? And uh, she used to take them, and then she took old scrap clothes and made quilts and things. Like that. Wow, she was very innovative. Like yeah. that. And my grandmother did the same thing. Right. Yeah. So you're in the new home now. You're, you're sharing the bedrooms like most people are with your brothers. Um, what were your jobs there as a child? We're going to move on to your older Well, we, we all had a job. Yes. My older boy and, uh, and, and my sisters, they had to do the washing and mop the floor and things. And we were working outside. Sure. And what yeah, were you we doing? We were doing the wood, getting the wood in. Feeding the chicken, milking the cow. <laughs> so what time did your day start in the morning? Oh, well, 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock, right. we had to get ready to do that before we go to school. Right, know? I understand. 
So, so what was bedtime, given all this hard work you did? I would imagine you, you weren't staying well, up. Well, I think it was 8 o'clock. <laughs> I would imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. and that was all night. Right, right. And did sometimes you, we had to have a candle. Right. Did you have electricity in the house? No, sir. So how did you see at night with the oil lamp? The oil lamp and, and, and the candle. But the very first car your family had was... That was a, that was a Model T. And do you know about when that was? Mm, that was in that was in the 30s. I mean, I was old enough to know it was a you know, it was a car because most time it were horses, you know. Now, yeah. talk to me about um, your water source. <clears throat> Did you, by chance, have a spring? Oh, we had to go, uh, we had to get it from a spring. Ah, I thought so. Yeah, we had to get it from a spring. And uh, it's still there. Oh, the spring. And then uh, later on, my father uh, uh, put a pipe in up there. Mm -hmm. And then he took the uh, horse and made a furrow all the way down to the house, good little way. Right. Then they put a pipe in there. Right. And then they uh, put a, a spigot on the end. And then when that pipe filled up with water, right. if it had run out, we don't have no water. We had to wait till it filled back up. The, spring, the, the, the water level rose again. Yeah. He brought plumbing into place. How about that? That's great. And my father, see, he used to, uh, uh, well, didn't many people know it, but he used to make all the flour meal and stuff. Right there, here, Madison Mill. Can you tell me more about this church? Well, the only thing I know that I had to walk from the bottom of the hill down there, up here, and I went to Sunday school here. <clears throat> and every Sunday, when they ring their bell, I had to be here. And here. My parents want me to be in the church here. Yeah, I used to sing in the choir until one time they had me singing by myself, and uh, I made a mistake and everybody laughed. They haven't sung me for, haven't sung since. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you first started living here, how many families were living here in Little Oh, my, a lot, a lot of people in, in this area. <clears throat> kids, good. They roads used to be full of kids coming to Sunday school. Can you tell them where people were baptized? Which is oh yeah, we were baptized, baptized right in the Rapid Down River, right, yeah, yeah. right back at the mill. Right. And I tell you, we used to call it a chicken hole. <laughs> 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 That's where we were baptized in that hole. Right. He's called a chicken hole. What, because you were scared to go in it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we used to be scared to go in it, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. And did you, how old were you when you started going to school here on Little Peter's Road? I think I was about seven or eight years old, I think. Right. And where was school held in the beginning? Great Bay of Peasenberg, Fisher Lodge. So that served, it did serve as a school. Yeah. Can you also share with folks who are not familiar with how education started, was everyone like in the first grade or did you have people of different ages in the same room? Right? Yeah, I think they, from the first grade to the sixth grade. Mm -hmm. well, I, bet, I said we had about 20, 28 or 30 wow. in, in, in that school up there. And that would be with one adult instructor or more? One, one teacher. Right, right. Just so we know, uh, was there a problem with behavior on the part of children, or was that sort of an understanding between the teacher and families that there would be order? <laughs> I'm just wondering how. Well, we were behave, you know. Right, that's what I'm thinking. I mean, we was good. Right. I mean, sometimes we may act up. You know, somebody may act up. Right. Yeah. But but we were scared to act up. That's what I was thinking. Because <laughs> if, if we if we we'll get it at school and then get it at home, we get home. Right. <laughs> <laughs> hey. <laughs> that's what we think our techniques today. All right. Yeah, I mean, we'll get it too. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thank you. My father.
father was that managed a big sheep state, or actually three of them in my childhood, different ones. And um, so we lived on a, it was about 3,000 acres, I think, the, the one that I spent most of my life on. And um, of course, at least 3,000 sheep, completely surrounded by sheep. Sheep in New Zealand are tightly woven. We had about, usually had three shepherds, and each one of those shepherds usually had about four, at least four, probably five dogs. They, the dogs came with the shepherds. They couldn't manage without those. Right. And my father had five, five or six. Were they border collies? Oh yes. We were allowed to play with the pups until they were a few weeks old, but after that we didn't we didn't fall with the dogs. The dogs belonged to the owner. You weren't supposed to mess with them. Um, did your father or any of your shepherds compete with the dogs? Yes, my father did. And I think some of the others had at times, but I did go to the dog trials with my father, yes. Well, we used to like to go out when when they were going out to um, work with the sheep or the cattle. We did have cattle. Um, we always liked to go. If we were allowed to, we liked to get a horse and go. And so we did do that. That was always a fond memory. You know, on a farm like that, you have to be able to do everything. So they 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 used horses. We did no tractors. And um, so Dad used to be building ponds and roads and all sorts of things with his horses. And so we'd go and sit for hours watching him. It just doesn't sound very exciting, but it, it could it can get exciting. Candles. It's a wonder we didn't burn the place down. Uh, we had a car. But it, to do that, you faced, for the first eight miles, you were going through other farms. So there were, there were four creeks that had to be forded. There was no bridges. And eight gates that had to be opened and closed just to get out the main road. That was the driveway. So that could be tricky if it rained. They were all flash flood creeks and so if it rained up in the hills, you went out in the afternoon. When you came back, the creeks could all be up. It was quite exciting at times. Mm -hmm. My parents made a list for a year. And when they sent the wool, when the lorries came out with, to get the wool, of course they didn't have anything on them. And so they brought the stores out for a year and it all went into the storeroom. So they, they used to make this list. You'd see the two of them walking around looking a bit dazed, you know, and then making little notes and then they'd talk to each other about it and you'd hear them say, oh, well, I don't know how many pounds of flour we better get this year. You know, it came in 100 pound bags. So we had a whole, a whole store with shelves and everything in it. I was in hedgerows then, and we moved out that morning had to go across the road. And I was ammunition barred in, and there was a, and they, <coughs> they seen her. I, we seen, I seen some German troops running across the field running. And the machine gunner, he must have was, shoot, was shooting out of my guess, and here come a burp like that right down, right down across his gun, and I'm playing, laying, <laughs> Laying there too, he made one burst across that gun. And I'll see that too. Now I was 
a lot of things you might want to see, you, do, you don't want to think about, but it's still there. The, <laughs> the Battle of Woes was on the 16th, they say. Well, on the 17th that morning when I got there, I, I was captured. I had my hands up like that, and that damn German shooting at me. I had zing, a zing, a couple wow. of bullets going by me, but he missed me. Then he took us to to the barn, where it was about 150 of us in a barn. They kept well, they must have kept us well, kept us there for three or four days. With nothing to eat. And, uh, finally got a potato about the third day. I'll tell you, but they sold us. If we burnt the barn down, they're gonna shoot 50 of us. Like the window was, was still in the barn, and one morning, in other words, you could stand in the door, you could see them, they bought horse wagons full of dead German back, right on the door of the wagon, just like cord, cordwood. And, but they come through one morning, picked a bunch of us, and took us to a cemetery, and, uh, we had to dig a grave. But you didn't know whether that was your grave or somebody else's. And then after that, I guess they took us from that barn, put us in some boxcars, and took us on down the track someplace, take an interview of you. And you and them buildings, you done heard people talk about gas and your stuff like that, and they turned around, you know, make, give you a bath or they sprayed you. They shot us one time. And you were afraid that you were going to be gassed? Yeah. Uh, you uh, didn't know what was coming out of them holes there. Uh, and took us out to put us in boxcars again, hauled us on down to the track someplace. We wound up in Dresden, Germany. And uh, we w worked in the steel mills there, though. I cut pipe, you know, like, you know, the elbow, and, uh, <clears throat> uh, see if, I wonder damn well ain't dead. <laughs> and it, <laughs> old Jägermeister, he had it set on five. I watched him go away. I set it back on three. But he fed you, we have a cabbage and potatoes, potato soup and some sand, sugar beets. Maybe once in a while you see a strip of meat into it. There's some horse that they got, got rid of. Right. But anyhow, it, we had, they fed us once every 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Then finally, I guess it come in May, we didn't do it. So the, it uh, they come in there one morning took us out and started marching us on down the road. And just thinking, next thing I know, we didn't see no guards. We was just left alone. So I just, like I wept and walked on down the road and then uh, run into that night. And I guess a couple of us, was three of us more together, we went behind a building, lay down, went to sleep that night. And, Got up next morning, try to find us something to eat or stuff like that. And we come down out of the woods, down off. And next thing I know, I was looking, look, there, looking down the road, here come a tank. And I, damn, I thought it was an American tank. It was an American tank, but the, but the Russians had them, see. We were sitting eating our supper, and damn, a, a Russian officer busted in and he was, he was going to kill us. And we told him it was Americanos, Americanos. And uh, he had an interpreter with him, and he told him, oh, he was going to kill us because we didn't salute him. We hell, I didn't know who he was. <laughs> <laughs> then we come into another town, and we were walking to it, on trying to find where the Americans were. Well, then we got to the little town, they, it was full of Russians. And this one woman, German woman, was big, this 
to come in the house, and come on in. So we went in there. And that woman, she, she cooked for us, and we scrounged around, found stuff, and give her food and things like that. And it was on a Sunday. We were sitting. I was sitting at the table, and another boy. We might have been playing solitaire or something. And three Russians busted in the house. And we told them we'd America. They'd go in there right on upstairs. And when they come out of upstairs, it was stripped. See, that that Sunday morning, she, her daughter was coming, and I don't know where he was, but the them boy, them jerks would have probably raped her and done whatever, killed her. Hell, I seen they do, they shoot you. They shot one man right in the middle of the street because he run run a shoe store. Yeah, they leave drop where you. Oh, they're no different where they dropped you at. Fight over each other, steal bicycles from that one woman. Uh, this is true. She was had a car. And she was getting stuff out the house, put it in the car, and she had a child into it. They took the damn car and took off. She is still hauling for it. She's in hard to wear wherever went. She never probably never got it back. I don't remember too much until maybe I got in first grade, because they didn't have kindergarten or, you know, head start or nothing like that. Uh, so my early memories, you know, is first grade, going to the old wooden school. I remember the school just like it was yesterday. And uh, I think maybe I was there like a year before we moved into Prospect Heights, the new school. Yes, it was so beautiful. Oh my God, we walked in there, it was like, heaven, you know, compared to where we sure. came from. I remember coming to church every Sunday. That was a must, Sunday school and church. You had to go to Sunday school and church. Oh, I uh, always loved church. I can remember as a child, I used to sing in the choir up there. And when we were saying some of the songs that we were singing, mm -hmm. I remember just passing out a couple of times because I was just so excited about singing these songs. Mm -hmm. And I still feel that way today. It's it just something about that that really get to me. And uh, like I said, we was here every Sunday. The neighborhood was a great neighborhood. It was family oriented. Everybody looked out for everybody. And I mean, you know, if you saw your child doing anything, the neighbors would call and report it, and they were allowed to chastise you or whatever. Back in those days, they raised other people's children. Uh, I guess the parents went off to work or whatever and had nobody watch the kids. And my grandfather raised those kids with my mother, brother, and her. And I can remember my mother working four or five houses on that road she worked. And I can remember her, one day I asked her, well, how much money do you make? She said, 50 cents an hour. And I said, oh my, I, you know, it was just so hard to believe that you would go out and work for 50 cents an hour, but back in those days, hey, I guess that's what it was. And uh, I think she wanted to, maybe about six other uh, people lived in the house that day, my grandfather raised. Yes. And uh, I can't ever remember going hungry. We always had plenty of food on the stove. My grandfather had hogs and chickens and, you know, everything there that we needed. So, like I said, we had a good childhood. Yeah. And I can remember uh, maybe one of the first ones had telephone. I know my grandma, my father, my mother didn't have telephone. They used to come to our house and use their phone. And they didn't have TV, they just come to our house and used to uh, look at TV. I can't remember a bad day. I really can't. Back then, even though the parents might have been going through a rough time, but the children didn't know. Now, I found out in later years, as I got older, how my mother struggled. 
But growing up, we didn't know she was struggling. And like my grandparents was a big uh, help to my mother because my mother and father had split up. He had moved on and she was raising six of us. Yes, and as we got older, we started taking care of the younger ones. Yes, so I learned how to cook at a very young age. I mean, we worked so hard as children because my grandfather raised gardens and we had to get out there and pick potatoes, tomatoes, and string beans. At that time, we didn't have running water. We had to go to the spring and bring water back to the house. We had to help him mow the grass because this was a lot of property. And we didn't believe in those days of putting parents in nursing home. And when my grandfather got sick, we took care of him at home. My mother worked, and we was like the nurses. We took care of our grandfather. I didn't know my grandma because she died earlier. And, you know, we had to bathe him and everything because he had a stroke. We had to feed him. So our life, we worked. We worked as children. I mean, we did have a little time to play, but not a whole lot. We played at home. We pl played marbles, jacks, baseball, any game that hot scotch, anything you could do outside, we done it. We made uh, wagons and go cars. We slept ride. And we just had a good childhood, like I said, until I reached the age that I realized it wasn't as good as we thought it was, you know, <laughs> yeah. I think as I really started getting older, I don't know, for some reason, I knew this wasn't the life I wanted uh -huh. as a young child. I, I, I just didn't want that life. And I always was trying to find a way, how could I get out from this? Hmm. Yes, it was, I don't know what it was in my head, but I just knew this wasn't me. My sister got killed in a car accident at 17, I was 16. And once she got killed, it was like, it was really over with. Yeah, for me here. And my grandfather was going to New York one Christmas, and he asked me, you want to ride? He just called me Tut. Tut, you want to ride with me? And I said, yes. And I knew that was my escape. And I packed my clothes, and my mother said, why are you packing so many clothes? I said, well, you know, people in the city, they chase two or three times a day. You know, I just want to make sure I have enough. But I knew what I was going to do. I wasn't coming back. And I went to New York and I stayed. We met in school. He and I'm not too proud of this, but he and one of my best friends were sweet on each other. But all of a sudden, the two of us were sweet on each other. And this was in early high school. So when I was allowed to date, which was 16, I was allowed to go out. He was my first and only boyfriend, real boyfriend. We were married at Orange Baptist Church in 1957. And it was, it was a real special day. It was on a Sunday, Sunday afternoon. But it was a comedy of errors. <laughs> First of all, the, the one thing I remember was we, I, it's always been my, my dream to kneel for prayer, but the Baptist church didn't do that and didn't have a kneeling bench or anything. So at the time I was working for a florist and she said, don't worry, I'll, I'll fix it for you. I'll have a kneeling bench there for you. But she had a beautiful pillow on it, but, but she failed to attach it to the, the, the bench. And when we knelt for the prayer, the, the cushion slipped 
and he cut his shin on the, the edge of the bench. He looked up at the minister and said, Good God, that hurt like hell. <laughs> <laughs> you could hear him all over the church. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next thing was, and look, I tore my brand new britches. <laughs> and he had, and his, his, his uh, knee was bleeding. So he had. But the whole church was in a roar, I'll tell you. <laughs> in a roar. And then after, after we took our vows uh, at the altar and we were getting ready to leave, my dress had a, a hoop in it. So when we went around the, the first pew, I had a hard time getting around there because that hook didn't want to go with two of us together. So he went down several pews in front of me and said, if you want to go with me, come on here. <laughs> Just like that. So that was, that was another thing, you know, that made it fun and, and, and the memories. He was in almost three years, and part of that time I had no idea where he was. He was on missions, and I was not allowed to know where he was. And what happened during that time in the military, when he was in, in the service? What kind of call did you get? Oh, I had a call that he had been killed in action. and. I kept asking for the body, and they kept saying, it, it'll be shipped to you, it'll be shipped to you. And it was forever, it seemed like. It was a long time. And come to find out he had been on a mission, and they had to kill him off in record, on record to keep him safe. So we went through that, and it was, I know it was harder on him than me, but it was hard, you know, thinking he was deceased and wondering if he suffered or, you know, all the things that would go through your mind. And then never being able to, to get the body back for a burial. And um, it was a hard time. I was praying that he was all right, but I was praying also that that there was not a mix-up in names or whatever, because I didn't want anybody else to go through that too. Can you tell me the story about when you learned that he was alive and then how you all were re reunited? We cried. We could not hold each other enough. Oh, it was terrible. It was a terrible time. Oh, I dropped to my knees and thank God for it. And, and just prayed that it didn't happen to another person. And then you were reunited mm -hmm. where? Um, he came home. He came home on, on leave, and I met him at the train station. In Orange? Mm-hmm, in Orange. And that's the first time you'd seen him in three years? Mm-hmm. Isn't that something? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, life, life has been ups and downs, but it's been all worth it. <laughs>